If you do not obey all commands, force will be used against you to take you into custody. Turn around, hands up, talk to the nigga. Stop, 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 some stupid people think they have the ability to hijack a plane full of passengers, but what happens when their plan fails and they meet the law enforcement officers instead? Let's look at five such cases in this video. On October 2nd, 2022, during an American Airlines flight to Dallas, Texas, something unexpected happened. A 35-year-old passenger named Keith Deemer decided it would be a brilliant idea to send a distressing message to everyone on board using Apple's airdrop. This alarming action forced the pilot to divert the plane and immediately alert the authorities. Attention, passengers on plane is Albuquerque Police Department. I need everybody at this time to go ahead and place their hands on the top of their head. No, no, go to front. I need everybody to stay seated. Go ahead and keep your heads up. I need passenger Keith Deemer. Hands your head, sir. Hands your head. At this time, hands in your head. Keith Deemer. I need you to stand up from your seat. We know you're sitting at 17F. Keith Deemer, I need you to stand up. I need you to step out to the center aisle. I need you to obey all commands given to you by the police. If you do not obey all commands, force will be used against you to take you into custody. Turn around, hands on top of your head. Hands on your head. Don't touch anything. Put your hands on your head. Put hands on your head. Put your left hand on the top of your head. Do it now. Just a few minutes into their flight, Deemer sent a message to all the passengers warning them that he was going to blow up the plane with a bomb he had supposedly planted. The announcement sent a wave of panic through the cabin, with everyone looking around in fear and confusion. However, it soon turned out to be nothing more than a twisted joke. While some passengers might have sighed in relief, the police did not find it amusing at all. Dimer is slowly walking backward into a pair of handcuffs, facing the serious consequences of his horrible prank. Keep walking, keep walking. Keep coming, he's gonna pass. Hands up. Right here. Right there is good. Up right there. Keep your hands on your head. I want your right hand to go down behind your back, sir. Right hand only. Right behind your back, keep it right there. Right hand on top of your head. I'm out of the room, y'all take your police department. I'm gonna be placing a set of handcuffs on you. My name is Sergeant Walker. Go ahead and place your hand behind your back, please. Let me double lock these real quick. Mine, 
With Deemer off the plane, the remaining passengers were asked to deboard, allowing authorities to conduct a thorough search of the aircraft. To everyone's relief, nothing suspicious was found. Keith Deemer was subsequently charged with conveying false and misleading information and interfering with a flight. If found guilty, he could face up to 25 years in prison. From American Airlines, let's move on to Frontier Airlines, where a man was arrested for threatening to stab flight passengers with a knife. But before we move on to the next case, please hit that like button. On November 11th, 2022, a Frontier Airlines flight heading to Tampa had to make an emergency landing in Atlanta. Authorities detained a man, 42-year-old William Liebisch, after he allegedly threatened passengers with a box cutter. Liebisch's erratic behavior during the flight prompted the emergency diversion to Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport. Once the plane landed, officers swiftly evacuated the passengers and apprehended Liebisch, ensuring the safety of everyone on board. Before the emergency landing, one of the passengers overheard William saying he was going to stab someone on the plane. Alarmed, the passenger immediately alerted the flight attendants. The situation escalated quickly, and the crew took the threat very seriously. In the end, William had no one to blame but himself for the chaos he caused. However, that didn't stop him from complaining about the handcuffs now securely fastened around his wrists. Despite his grumbling, it was clear to everyone that his own reckless words had led to this mess. You relax and put the cuffs on right, man. I need resist, man. Hold on, Calm down. Breathe. Okay. This is bananas, man. What the f is wrong with you, man? Need a Ow! Ah! Okay, I will fix them. Yeah, after it. you rip my ass off, man. We're trying to fix it, relax. So, you yeah, see her fixing it, she's fixing it real good, ain't she? Come on, man. Hey, man, what the fuck? Relax. Man, what's wrong with you, man? God. Okay. Um, can I have my I'll That's my phone. Just my phone right there. Okay, we'll get your phone. Ass on the line. Oh, that's the weirdest. I'll go get the stuff. Yeah, get that off. William Liebisch was then escorted off the plane and surrounded by law enforcement officers. He was charged with interfering with the duties of a flight crew and carrying a weapon aboard an airplane. Despite any protestations, he ultimately pled guilty to the charges against him. As a consequence, he was sentenced to a daunting 30 months behind bars, followed by an additional three years of supervised release. Fortunately, William admitted to his mistake, but in this case, our suspect goes insane, screaming that the devil was speaking to him. On June 4th, 2021, a 43-year-old man named Aziel Norton tried to break through the pilot door on a flight from Los Angeles to Nashville over the weekend. Norton hurried to the front of the plane out of the blue and slammed the door to the flight deck hard. Why you ask? Well, we don't know, but according to Norton, he was angry. So angry that he even pushed a flight worker who tried to help him. In an instant, the situation got worse and other passengers had to step in to calm and restrain Norton. Thankfully, they moved quickly and correctly, making sure that everyone on board was safe. <laughs> Put that on the plane. Pull 
the next group. You gotta stop this play. 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 Fortunately, the passengers and flight crew were able to restrain him by working together, which kept everyone on board safe. They calmly and firmly led Norton to the back of the plane. He kept banging on it, like that. It's a no-no. The second he banged on it, it was a wrap. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So, we're going to have to get him back. We need to go back. So, I need all available uh, people. We have... Uh, I need another belt. I'm here for you. What do you need? Okay, so I need... Uh, Man or woman, do not care. Uh, we need him to go all the way towards the back. Are you gonna drag him back? We're gonna drag him back. Let's go. <laughs> we cannot be here. We cannot be here. Okay, guys. One, two, three. Three. One, two, three. You are in the aisle, please. Clear space in the aisle. Thank you. Clear space in the aisle. Norton claimed he was hearing voices in his head, asking for the plane to be grounded out of fear for his life. He said this while looking very upset. All the commotion and loud noise quickly caught the pilot's attention. Realizing anything could have happened, he made the quick decision to land the plane at the nearest airport, which at that moment was Albuquerque. When the plane landed, the authorities were already ready to handle the problem. I don't know what happened was, I came in flight, I was sitting right, standing right here, started banging on the door, and said, Here and there, right? Right? Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Apparently, he's going to tell you how he feels. As soon as the pilot told the cops what happened on the plane, the cops knew it was time to get to work. Norton, who was about to meet the long arm of the law, was restrained severely by the officers. They walked up to Norton to detain him for questioning. This yellow one that they have on here, okay? So it should snap off. Well, sit up. What did you stand? Come on, go ahead and push yourself up. If you need up, we'll help you, okay? Come on, we got you. Yeah, we got you a little bit. Go ahead and sit down up as much as you can. All right. Try to get your feet 
Norton was placed in a holding cell after correctly being placed in handcuffs. In what appeared to be an effort to hijack a flight, he had been successful in disrupting the flight. The chaos that he caused was so severe that the Federal Bureau of Investigation had to get involved. As a consequence of this, they came in to have a conversation with Norton on their own, intent on getting a grasp of the disturbing actions he had taken. What I'm going to ask you, Mr. Norton, is, is what happened on the flight? What, what happened that uh, this whole incident transpired? Well, what happened was uh, I got onto a plane, and on the plane, I realized that everything is a video game. Mm -hmm. And that I had been hypnotized by friends into believing that there was a video game. Mm -hmm. And so, I thought, I thought, I thought that, I thought the devil was going to rape me. Okay. And it's either take a choice between the devil raping me or going insane. Right. And so, or at least pretending to go insane. So I thought, then I thought, I wanted to be raped. And so I thought, what is the worst outcome? And I thought the worst outcome was for the devil to rape me forever. But then I thought that by thinking that, I had, and then I'm not choosing that, that'd be out of weakness. And so I chose to go with charging the pilot quarter. Well, what, were you intending on hurting yourself or hurting anybody in the plane? Was that my intention to hurt anybody in the plane? Yes. It was not. It was not? No. Are you intending on hurting yourself or anybody right now? Satisfied with their investigations, the Bureau decided to charge Aziel Norton with interfering with a flight attendant while they were performing their duties. Apart from this, if found guilty, Norton could face up to 20 years in prison. The severity of the potential sentence reflects the seriousness of his offense and the risks posed to the safety of the flight. The cloud is going to see me. Hmm? I'll put somebody in charge in the county. You go into the city. And then, oh. that's, but that's, you know, they, they combine oh. the city and the county, okay? Now let's look at another case where a woman was caught carrying a gun at the airport, but there's a twist to it. On August 26, 2021, TSA agents at Cleveland Hopkins International Airport noticed something suspicious. In the routine screening process, they discovered that 33-year-old Laurel Levant was carrying a concealed pistol in her purse. Acting swiftly, the TSA immediately alerted the police, setting off a series of events that would ensure the safety of everyone at the airport. I would have never brought it. Can I see my... Hey, just Could a you second. just settle, settle down for a moment, okay? I'll talk to you in a minute, okay? For some reason, Levant forgot that her 380 caliber Taurus was in her bag and brought it into the airport by accident. When she realized how bad her mistake was, she started to freak out. She knew she could be in a lot of trouble because of what was going on. The only way to get out of this situation was that she had to show her concealed carry guns permit. She hoped that this would be enough to explain her mistake and keep her out of more trouble. So you have any carry concealed weapon permit? 
I, it's registered. I went to the store and let me, I got... Let me ask you something. Do you have a carry concealed weapon permit? No, no. Okay. Okay. You have the right to remain silent, okay? Anything you say can and will be used against you in court, okay? You have the right to have an attorney present. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you free of charge. You got the right to remain silent. Listen to what I'm saying, okay? okay. So, you, you understand your rights? Yes, yes, I understand. Okay, you're right over. At this point, you're going to be under arrest, okay? For CCW's current concealed weapon, okay? I know, but I didn't mean it. I took it out of my garage. Let me tell you. I okay? know, There's I know. There's nothing we can do about this, okay? Oh, I'm scared to go to jail. Yeah, it's a, I'm really there's scared. No, I'm there's, scared no, there's no other way around this, thing, okay? I don't want to go to jail. Just, I have to prove in my listen, name, please. I already, I already told you, okay? Oh, I wouldn't have did that. It, it, it's not about me. That's the rule. This is a federal point over here, okay? Oh. Ohio passed a law called Constitutional Carry. This law lets certain people carry a gun without a permit. The law was made by Senate Bill 215, which was signed by Governor Mike DeWine. Even though a permit is no longer needed, there are still other legal conditions and limits that must be followed. People must be at least 21 years old and not be against state or federal law to own a gun. They must also follow all the rules about where guns can and cannot be handled. Unfortunately for Levant, at the time of her arrest, it was still illegal to carry a concealed weapon without a CCW permit in the state of Ohio. Levant was well aware of this fact, and she knew exactly what it meant for her. As the officers approached, the reality of her situation sank in. She had just scored herself a one-way ticket to jail. Where else do you have? Do you have anybody else with you? She can leave. It's okay. Can she take your stuff or you want to keep your stuff? I want to keep it. She got to okay. get her flight. Let her know that you're going to go to jail today, okay? Right. I'm going to jail. What is that being called? No. It's called you CCW. Don't... It's carrying concealed weapon, okay? You gotta turn around. Oh okay. my god. Yeah. Uh -huh. I took it out of my garage and took the picture and to lock it away. To lock up my house and forgot it in my purse. I put it, I put it, keep it out. I'm about to go. I was rushing. I locked my room up because my sister in there. What's up, this sir? She's on and off. She had a CCW. So if I had a CCW, I won't go to jail. You still would be charged, but you wouldn't go to jail if you had that permit. Levant, who was already restrained and on her way to jail, spent the next few minutes desperately attempting to make up the mistake that she was responsible for. During her appeal to the cops, she explained her activities in the hope that they would understand her viewpoint on the matter. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm about to lose my career. Hey, uh, we're gonna walk. What's that? We're gonna walk yeah. all the way to the office. Yeah. All right. Oh my God, y'all. Yeah, let's walk. Who's on top. Yeah, let's walk to the office. Sorry, but I'm scared of jail. Sorry, I ain't never did nothing bad. I got that good because it's my neighborhood. <laughs> I wanna never do that. I'm scared of the police. I don't want to go there. Why are you scared of the police? I'm not you. I'm, oh, okay. You know what I'm scared for. What? This is the thing, okay? I'm really this scared. Is, I'm that scared. point that you came across, that's a federal point, okay? I'm going it's to not, federal jail. Listen, no, listen to what I'm saying. That's a federal point right there, okay? So it's not just the police that you're dealing with. It's with the federals, too, okay? So the feds gonna come get me? They will talk to you. Oh. They will talk to you. But it's in my name. Is that okay? Yeah, everything is okay, but you came with a weapon I know, but through a federal point. That's, that's the dilemma. No, you're going to jail right now. But you will go just the county. Then once you talk to the judge, they might give you a bond and you come out and then you deal with it, okay? Did y'all ever hear something like this? How old are you? 
30. Levant was clearly upset about the idea of going to jail. Tears filled her eyes when she tried to make her point, and her voice shook. She was sorry, but it was too late. No matter how much she begged and pleaded, nothing could change what would happen. The choice was final, and she had to deal with the results of what she did. How do you forget that? Listen, so my sister in my house, right? She's yeah. still right. Mm -hmm. I took it out the box and put the clip in there and paused and locked it in my room because I mm -hmm. got a lock on my room mm -hmm. and I forgot it in my purse. Uh, but that small person, you didn't check that? I've got a lot going on. I was oh, fresh and I didn't want to tell why. Sorry about that. The friends going to try to come get me. They go, do know you I'm a Kasoy. They're about to ruin my name. I'm sorry that this happened to you. <laughs> Yeah, we have these issues over here. Some people have their carry concealed permits, so we don't arrest the person. Oh. We just do the report, <laughs> we take the gun, and then they gotta deal with the rest. Yeah. When they do not have one, I then we have to... In my name. Yeah, I'm that's so okay. Scared. That's not a problem. It's just that permit <sighs> that makes the difference of I going to jail or not. Kidding. That's all it is. It's not that it's gonna avoid the issue, no. It's just the issue of going to jail or not. That's a simple thing. I get a felony. It's a felony. It is? Mm -hmm. Can I fight it? Yes, of course. She didn't fight it. Laurel Levant pleaded guilty to breaking the concealed carry laws. Accepting her fate, she consented to give up her pistol and pay the legal fees that were linked with the situation. As a result of the circumstances, her time served in jail was excluded from her sentence. Let's now look at the case of an annoying woman who snuck into the plane after she was denied entry because she was 45 minutes late. On July 10th, 2022, at the Spirit Terminal of Miami International Airport, all passengers had just boarded a flight headed to Detroit, Michigan. As everyone got comfortable in their seats, Spirit flight workers saw a woman trying to get on the plane 45 minutes after it was supposed to leave. She chose to do something about it herself when she was turned away. Outside the plane, she snuck on, pushing past flight attendants and even jumping over other people to get to her place. The flight attendants told their boss right away because the woman said she would hurt someone if they didn't take off. As she made her threats worse, saying she would make the captain fly the plane, police were quickly called. I, I sorry, I sorry, I just, I just woke up. Like just like you guys are working with you guys. Uh, for what I understood, that just rushed in. Um, the agent went to close the door, and there was one that was sitting on the flight and was refusing even to move. Philip, is uh, Stephanie uh, Stephanie inside? They said that already. She's inside. She's inside. She's inside the plane. Uh, I just let me just go in because there was one that was refusing uh, getting out. It's disgusting how much this woman acts like she deserves better. She wants to get off the plane when everyone else does too. She is so stubborn that no matter how many times the crew asks her to change her mind, she refuses. Her refusal doesn't go away, which causes a tense standoff that ends with the cops stepping in. Because of one person's rude behavior, this means that everyone on board will have to get off the plane, which will mess up their trip plans. Everybody else. 
this against you for okay. trespassing. Yeah. So can you I'm in, and guess what? I'm going to beat the case because I'm not trespassing. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we're going to have to declaim everybody. Oh, 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 oh,
Then y'all gonna suffocate me. This woman found herself in a heap of trouble, facing charges of disorderly intoxication and destruction of aircraft. The courtroom buzzed with anticipation as the judge announced her sentence. Instead of jail time, she was sentenced to probation. It was a sigh of relief for her, but a stern reminder of the consequences of her actions. Stumble upon a man in a garage in the middle of the night. He chats with police for a few minutes. Little do police know, he's the suspect. There he is, we got an escapee. Oh, shit. <laughs> Where from? Uh, a prison. There's a prison here? Yeah. Crime and deception often go hand in hand, and in the world of fugitives and felons, we encounter astonishing tales of cunning creativity. Today, we're diving into a series of gripping stories where individuals went to extraordinary lengths to outwit the authorities. But first, please smash the like button and show some love to your favorite channel as YouTube is not a fan of such videos. In 2006, Richard Lee McNair pulled off an incredible escape from a Louisiana prison. Here's how he did it. McNair built a secret hiding spot, kind of like a DIY escape pod, right inside the prison. He used what he could find, like cardboard and tape, and added a breathing tube. His genius trick was that he hid it under mailbags on a pallet. The prison staff had no clue and moved it to a warehouse. Once alone, McNair cut himself out and just walked out to freedom, but the craziest part was still to come. After the escape, McNair was jogging near some railroad tracks in Ball, Louisiana. Officer Bordelon spots McNair jogging near some railroad tracks. Given the recent prison break, the officer is on high alert and decides to question McNair. You live around here, boy? No. Where do you live at? Down the road by, uh, Pineville. Pineville? Uh-huh. Okay. McNair, caught off guard but not panicking, gives a fake name, Robert Jones. A little later, he slips up and says, Jimmy Jones, but the officer doesn't notice the switch. When Bordelon inquired about his address, McNair was quick on his feet. He claimed he was staying at a hotel and working in roofing for his brother, a perfect cover for an out-of-towner. Do you have any form of identification on you? No, man. What's What's your name? Robert Jones. Robert Jones? Uh Uh-huh. I'm not supposed to be on the track. No, that's not the problem right now. What's your address? I don't have an address. I'm at the hotel. We're working on uh, houses and stuff like that, roofing. Roofing? Yep. Okay. For my brother. All right. What's your name again? Jimmy Jones. After the officer informs McNair about the search for an escaped convict, McNair acts all surprised, laughing it off as if hearing it for the first time. The officer, still suspicious, contacted his colleagues to verify McNair's identity. What is? We got an escapee. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Where from? A uh, prison. There's a prison here? Yeah. Hey, this call. Subject wear glasses? Nothing about glasses. Can you find out? I'm out with a white male on the tracks at uh, Gilly Williams. You can call my little brother. Where about? Take your glove off. Any tattoos or anything? Look it over. No, no, I'm just. No, nah, he's clean. How old is your guy? You how old? 50. I was born in 56. You said born in 56. What color eyes you got? Green. Well, kind of a turquoise blue. Turquoise blue? Yeah. <laughs> Wanna give me some more? <laughs> <laughs> Call my little brother, man. Did you guys notice how McNair remains calm and composed during the entire situation, making small talk and showing signs of amusement? In short, a perfect game of deception. Just see his reaction when the officer tells him that he looks like the escapee. You know the bad thing about it? What's that? You're matching up to him. Come on. <laughs> well, that sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. There he goes again, smiling things away. When questioned further about the scratches on his knees, McNair explains the cuts on his knees by saying he took a shortcut through a briar patch. Did you go through a briar patch or something? Well, yeah, roofing. I always roof in shorts and cut my uh, scratching up on, you know, the roofing. That's why your knees are all cut up? Yeah. Or y'all got pads? Huh? Y'all wear pads? Um, too hot. Rub, the pads rub your back of your legs and stuff. Um, where are you from? Huh? We're originally Dallas, Texas. Gotta give it to him. Looks like he's got an answer for everything, right? 
Spinning stories, he tells the cop about his brother dropping him off for work and how they couldn't get into their usual camper park. He even gives directions to a motel near Walmart, adding credibility to his story. What are you staying at? That uh, Titusville or Titus Inn? Titus Inn? Little old. Little old. Where's that at? I don't even know the address. We just got into town about a week ago, and he dropped me off to jog. I always jog about 12 miles a day. Well, where's y'all's motel at? Okay. What do you think now? Because like I say, uh, fuel always drives. Okay, Walmart's right there. Go right at Walmart, and there's a road. Is it 165? Right. 165 that goes south, and we're about two blocks. I mean, it's clean, but it, and the, it's family-owned. Little old, tiny hotel. Yeah, you know, like a motel deal park up there. And there's, uh, we, we got a camper, and we were trying to get into the camper place, but we didn't get into the camper place. There's a little, uh, uh, you drive down the, the road down, and there's uh, a place for uh, campers and stuff. And that's where we usually stay, but we couldn't get in there. Adding a touch of genius, he even had a friendly conversation with a cop as he tried to draw up a military connection with him. The cop told him to carry ID next time, and McNair jogged off, free again. In the future, carry some ID with you. See, I don't, in, I'm sorry. When I was in the military, we never carried our ID yeah. on base and stuff. So. On base is different. Yeah, know. You know, they assure you if you can cross on, you, you got something. Yep. But out here, you're in civilian life, you know. Were you in the military? No, I wasn't. I'm retired army. But, um... Yeah, in the future, if you're going to jog again, that way, I mean, if you get run over by a train, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to start second-guessing who he is, you can know. Can you write down your uh, phone number, your cell phone number, so I can have whoever calls you? Just call. You got a cell phone with you? No, hell no. I don't even have a cell phone or anything. Just call 911. That's all you got to do, and they'll get a hold to us. All right. That's hey, our quick line there. Have a good day now. Be careful, buddy. One can only imagine the relief he must be feeling at the moment, probably singing songs about his ingenuity and intellect. However, after a year and a half in October 2007, Canadian police caught him driving a stolen truck in New Brunswick, a hundred miles from the U.S. border, thus ending his short-lived freedom. Well tried, McNair, well tried. Up next, we're about to introduce you to another pair of cunning fugitives who took the art of deception to a whole new level. Joseph Jenkins and Charles Walker, both 34, found a way to break the chains of prison life, but not in the way you might think. Their escape from the Franklin Correctional Facility wasn't through tunnels or over fences. It was through paperwork, cleverly forged and deceitfully convincing. These two inmates managed to create fake release documents, complete with case numbers, a judge's forged signature, and seemingly legitimate court orders that reduced their life sentences to just 15 years. They sent these papers to the prison mailroom, which handles legal documents. But here's the twist. No one checked if these papers were legit. The prison staff unknowingly processed their release. Normally, there's a lot of cross-checking with courts and police before someone is released from prison. But in this extraordinary case, those steps were skipped. Jenkins walked out first on September 27th, greeted by his uncle Henry Pearson, who provided him with fresh clothes. He then visited his family and even went through post-release procedures like registering as a felon and getting his fingerprints taken, all without raising any suspicion. Walker followed suit a week later, on October 8th. His family, thinking their prayers were answered, were overjoyed. Without time for a family pickup, he was given a bus ticket by prison officials and sent on his way. Both men tried to blend back into society. Jenkins even planned a birthday party and Walker attended church. But they couldn't stay under the radar for long. The family of Roscoe Pugh, the man Jenkins was convicted of killing, alerted the state attorney's office after they received a notification of Jenkins's release. This set off alarm bells, and upon reviewing Jenkins's file, the forged documents were uncovered. Similarly, Walker's paperwork was discovered to be fake. A manhunt ensued. For more than two weeks, Jenkins had tasted freedom, and Walker for a week. My life would have been different if I wouldn't have saw it. I saw it. I thought I would not have to see them ever again in life because they had life sentence. If not for Pew's family's alertness, who knows how much longer they would have remained free. Particularly people with criminal minds come up with ingenious ways to beat the system. They have nothing but time on their hands. Authorities tracked them to the Coconut Grove Motor Inn in Panama City Beach, a spot known for its tourist attractions. On Saturday night, without any incident, Jenkins and Walker were recaptured and scheduled to face the judge once again after the bold prison escape. This is your first appearance you've been arrested for on an in-state warrant uh, that was issued from the Department of Corrections. Secretary uh, Michael Cruz. 
for one kind of escape, there is probable cause to uh, detain you based on the warrant that I read. There's been a request that you be held without bond. I've appointed the public defender to uh, represent you. He's there in the office if you have any immediate questions. I'm going to schedule you for a, a return first appearance on the um, 25th of uh, October just to uh, verify that you've been retrieved by the uh, Department of Corrections. Have a good day. Stage name for the judge. Walker Charles. <clears throat> Mr. Walker, this is your first appearance. You've been arrested on an in-state warrant uh, that was issued by the uh, Secretary of the Department of Corrections, Michael Cruz, for one count of escape. There is probable cause to detain you for the, uh, the charge. There's been a request uh, that you be held without bond. I'm going to honor that. I'm going to schedule you for a return first appearance on the 25th of October, uh, just to verify that you've been retrieved by the uh, Department of Corrections. You did not complete an application for the uh, appointment of a public defender, so I can't appoint one for you. However, there is one in the office if you have questions. Have a good day. In the wake of this incident, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, led by Commissioner Gerald Bailey, seized printers from the prisons and launched a full-scale investigation. The Corrections Department has since changed its verification process for early releases, now requiring confirmation directly from judges, not just court clerks. In a horrifying incident inside a prison, the lives of two inmates, Anthony George and Adam Cargus, collided with tragic results. Anthony, 32, high on drugs and alcohol, unleashed a violent attack on his 29-year-old cellmate, Adam. This brutal assault involved relentless hitting, kicking, and choking occurring right in their shared cell. Shockingly, this happened under the nose of a nearby guard, performing routine checks, oblivious to the horror unfolding just steps away. The commotion was so loud that it caught the attention of other inmates. They banged on their cell walls, shouting for help in a desperate bid to alert someone. But their cries went unanswered, and the assault continued unchecked. the situation turned even grimmer the next morning. In a shocking scene, Anthony George dragged Adam Cargus's body out of the cell. This happened in front of other inmates, but the guards initially didn't catch on to the seriousness of what had just happened. The dreadful truth of what happened in that cell, fueled by drugs and alcohol, eventually surfaced. Anthony George was brought to justice and sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for at least 10 years. Adding to the tragedy, it was revealed that Adam had expressed fear of his cellmate to his family just before the murder. I never expected that to happen in my life. The impact of this event extended beyond the prison walls, leaving a family grappling with an unimaginable loss, as seen in the heartbroken faces of the Cargus family entering the courtroom. In the shadows of deception and daring, these stories remind us of the thin line between freedom and captivity. Whether through cunning paperwork, a convincing facade, or a moment of horrific violence, the paths these individuals took serve as reminders of the complexities and failings within our justice systems. That's all for today's folks, and we will catch you in the next one.